it's Anthony Luskery, K-H-Z-T, and tonight's topic is uh, Technicians, Life Beyond Repeaters. And we're going to focus a little bit on uh, the HF privileges of technicians and some of the proposed uh, pri privileges. And then we're also going to talk about some other things you can do with the technician class license. And let me get my screen full size here again. There we go. Let me get my pointer working. Um, please, this is my contact information. Uh, you're, please feel free to email me. Um, this is my shack and this is me and my other life, which has been on hold because of the pandemic. I'm a trainman on a scenic railroad in the area here. Tonight's presentation has a lot of links in it. You can tell there's a link if you see the serif font and you see the little icon for links. Uh, of course, you can't click on them while I'm speaking tonight, but by copying down this link, you can access all the links later after the session. I also put that in the chat. So tiny.cc slash btech. So the current situation, uh, some informal observations. Most techs limit their operations to VHF and UHF repeaters with occasional simplex FM. Many get their licenses but fail to get on the air or get on and burn out quickly. Some upgrade their license, but many do not. There's been a, quite of a changing situation in the VHF UHF repeaters over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s, my wife and I were very active on our local repeater. Uh, we sort of got out of the habit, as did many other people, because of cell phones, texting, email, etc., cetera, uh, allowed connect conductivity, connectivity um, that was previously provided by the repeaters and by the feature that a lot of people that are just getting into the hobby will never know about, and that's auto patch, where we can make a phone call via the repeater. The other thing that's happened is some repeaters have switched over to digital uh, modes, DMR, D-Star, CF4M, and other things. So the days of hanging on the local repeater making a lot of contacts has sort of diminished greatly. The other thing that uh, has changed earlier, uh, novices and then technicians, uh, when they got HF privilege, same HF privileges as novices, spent uh, typically spent quite a bit of activity on the CW bands, the so-called novice CW bands on the HF bands. Tech enhancement added the 10 meter phone and data privileges, but the problem is 10 meters is highly dependent on the sun, sunspot activity levels and it's often limited to local contacts only when the sunspot activity is minimal. So it seems that some of the excitement of getting that first license may have faded along with the FCC's mailing out of paper licenses. So the current HF, I'm sorry, the current technician license privileges include HF on four bands, which were commonly known as the novice CW bands. Full privilege is on VHF, and on UHF and up, full privileges. And again, on HF, there's frequency and mode limitations both, with only CW being available on the first three bands. On 10 meters, the addition uh, in some portions of the band of some phone activity. So here's a diagram uh, shortened up from the FCC's main chart showing what privileges are available to current technicians. The AWRL submitted a petition to the FCC requesting an enhancement of privileges for technician license operators. These included the addition of phone and data privileges on a limited number of HF bands. And you can read the full petition from the link that is available here. Uh, the AWRL did this after uh, a variety of uh, surveys and other information gathering they did in the field. This is the current uh, tech license HF privileges. And these are the proposed privileges. The biggest change being the addition of phone on three bands in the HF area and the addition of RIDI and other digital modes, including FT8, FT4, in the current uh, CW allocation areas of 80 meters, 40 meters, and 15. There were no ch changes proposed for 20 or 160 meters. No changes in the so-called work bands of 30, 17, or 12, or in the 60 meter band. There's also no proposals to change the power limits from the current limits uh, for these enhancements. Now, the big question is, when would this all take effect? Well, the problem is I can't tell you. I have no idea, 
and I have no idea if it'll ever occur or when it would occur. The AWRL survey and recommendations to the board for the entry level license committee were completed in 2016 through 2017. The proposal was submitted in February of 2018 and the FCC posted a request for comments on March 2019 over a year and two months, a uh, year and two months ago. Or, I'm sorry, just shy of two months, two years. And uh, further FCC action has not been taking place. So the answer I can give you right now is I don't know and I don't think anyone really knows for sure. So that leaves technicians with two options currently. A, they can upgrade to general class and then uh, possibly even up to extra class and or they can maximize the use of the current privileges they have available to them now under the current licensing structure. And that's where the title of this talk comes from. I'm suggesting that they go beyond the VHF, UHF repeaters that they're currently using as the main thing that technicians do and A, explore new modes, B, explore new bands, and C, explore new activities on both bands and modes. And I'll talk a little bit about those today. That's gonna to be the main focus of my talk. Uh, before we get started in that part, just a couple of myths about the tech license. Um, some people think that the tech license only gives you privileges for VHF and UHF repeaters. Uh, they might not have remembered all those questions that they had to study for when they took the test, uh, the other privileges they have, but that's the general impression of many people, uh, that there's no HF privileges. Uh, as we said already, there are some privileges. Uh, we'll go through those in a little more detail. Um, another thing is, Many people think, well, I can't get on the CW portions of the band because I'm not a 20 word per minute expert in CW. And I wanna tell you tonight that that's not necessary that you be an expert to make CW contacts. There's a number of ways um, and we'll address some of those tonight. Um, there's always the comment, there's no way to work DX on with a technician class license and that's not true. Uh, we'll look at some of the possibilities on that. Uh, some people say six and 10 meters are always dead. Well. The good news is they're gonna be going up, the sunspot activity is increasing and the activity should increase on both those bands. But let me tell you right now, all the last two years at the bottom of the sunspot cycle, I made almost daily contacts on both six and 10 meters uh, with FT8 during the uh, sunspot dreaded absences. Uh, some not, technicians think you can't work FT8 or FT4 and that's not true. You could work on six meters, 10 meters, and even on two meters and 440. And another comment quite often made is microwave bands are useless. So let's look at some of the um, activity areas and in, in some of the things that technicians can do with their current license. As I said earlier, A, new modes. Well, single sideband is something that many technicians do not explore, but they have privileges on 10, 6, 2, and, and any of the other bands. So there is the possibility of doing single sideband contacts with a technician class license. As we mentioned earlier, they have HF privileges on CW on 80, 40, 15, and 10. Uh, FT8 and FT4, uh, very much a lot of activity on 10 meters and six meters, but also during contest, VHF, UHF contest, some on, on two meters and 440. Um, fast scan TV on the UHF and microwave bands, uh, Wi-Fi uh, or emergency operations such as Arden are available on the UHF microwave frequencies. So those are some of the new modes that they might explore. Some of the new bands that they might think about exploring are HF, uh, single sideband on 10 meters, or HF CW on 80, 40, 15, or 10. Uh, VHF, six meters, uh, two, 220 megahertz, or microwave bands. As far as activities go, uh, simplex operation on VHF and UHF, whether it's FM or single sideband, um, is a lot different than repeater operations. And our local Aries group in Ohio has a single a simplex FM VHF uh, UHF contest this weekend. So anyone, in, it's close enough to Ohio to work FM simplex on six, two or 440, um, that's coming up this weekend. Satellites on the VHF and UHF bands are available fully to the technicians. And contesting. There are a number of VHF, UHF contests, but there's also a number of HF, CW contests and 10 meter phone contests that are available. Soda and POTA, 
uh, summit on the air or parks on the air activities can be done on 10 meters, six meters uh, very easily. <laughs> Uh, DMR is another type of activity that you might explore, digital, uh, digital radios and any of the different forms, D-Star, uh, C4FM or other ones. And Echolink is another activity that many people can explore. So a lot of things for technicians to try out that a lot of them are not doing right now. So I'm going to go through some of these in a little more detail. So let's talk about six meters first, often referred to as the magic band. Unlike 10 meters, techs have full privileges, all modes and all frequencies on all six meters. On 10 meters, techs are limited only to single sideband. They can't operate FM and they can't use the whole band. But on six meters, they can. Six meters can provide regional and even DX uh, contacts when the conditions are favorable. Now, of course, high sunspot activity can activate the F layer and make for great propagation on six meters, but you should not discount the sporadic E layer propagation, which can even result in contacts in, from my area in Ohio into Europe, into South America, um, into Alaska, Hawaii. So these can all be accomplished with e, e layer skip on six meters. And that's something that's available every year, not just during the sunspot times. There are certain times of the year, typically spring and summer when there's more E layer activity, but there's a lot more than we ever realized since people have been more active on FT8 and FT4 they found out that there's a lot more uh, distance propagation available if you just get on and call. Um, most newer FM radios, uh, HF radios, already include six meters, so it's not a separate radio to buy, uh, although you can buy six meter only radios or buy a VHF, UHF radio that has six in it. Uh, gain antennas are easily manageable size-wise and can be rotated with a simple t television antenna rotor, rotator. And even a dipole or J-pole antenna will work. My first six meter contact was from Ohio to Oklahoma by dangling a dipole out of a second story window of my apartment. It wasn't even hanging as a dipole, it was hanging down so both the wires were almost touching each other. And I was surprised that my first contact was Oklahoma. So that got me hooked back in my old novice uh, technician days. Single sideband and digital modes, FT8 and FT4 are very good operations on six meters, uh, but there is also CW and FM activity available. And I left my two meter radio on, on purpose because I wanted to point out the fact that it's been on for the last two hours and that's the first repeater contact I heard on two meters. So that's the, the sparsity that a new licensee might face. Um, I have some links for six meter resources. There's a great book available um, that you can click on and download. There's also a corresponding website that goes along with that. And then a whole link just on six meter antennas. 10 meter. 10 meter is the only HF phone band available to technicians. And the privileges include single sideband only, 28.3 three to 28.5. And I remember back in the days when I had my technician license, it always seemed that all the good stations were at 28.501. So I could never work them. They always hung out above there, which drove me crazy. Um, digital uh, FT8 and FT4 are very popular on 10 meters, but also PSK, RIDI and CW are available in the 28.0 to 28.3. Now, these are the areas where you can operate these, but there's specific areas on the band where you'll find each of these. So don't think that you should be operating uh, CW up at 28.299 and expect to get contacts or operating FT8 down at 28.010. Uh, find the right areas to do that. Uh, these 10 meters can provide regional and even worldwide DX when conditions are favorable. Again, increased sunspot activity or sporadic E layer. Now, one of the things I quite often have new technicians contact me uh, in my club or my licensing class and say, I got my license and I wanna get on 10 meters and I saw this great radio available from the local CB dealer and it has 10 meters. And I ask them, the first question I ask is, is it F FM or AM only? And they'll say, yeah, that's, isn't that okay? And I say, no, you won't be able to make any contacts with that because that is not the portion of the, that is not the mode that is allowed under your license. So a lot of people can be deceived into purchasing a radio that will not be helpful for their particular class of license. CB uh, vendor type 10 meter radios are also available with single sideband. They can be used, 
but they often favor CW type features with channelization, uh, Roger Beep, squelch, uh, no antenna tuner, no cat interface, et cetera. So they're not necessarily the best way to go. There were some um, radios such as the Realistic uh, 2510 put out by Radio Shack that was designed just for 10 meters. And it's very similar to some of these CB vendor um, single sideband radios. But because almost all real ham transceivers include 10 meter single sideband, you can find a radio for 10 meter single sideband fairly easily and often quite cheap by buying used or older equipment to get on the air. Uh, many of the ham multimode HF transceivers also have six meters. So if you're buying a HF uh, multiband ham radio, you'll get both 10 and six at the same time. Newer models of radios may make use of FT8, may make the use of FT8 or FT4 easier with built-in sound cards, but that doesn't mean old radios aren't perfectly acceptable for these modes and for the other modes of 10 meters. The good news for 10 meters is we're at the bottom of the sunspot. We're actually a little bit past the bottom of the sunspot cycle, so things are only looking up for the next five years. So it's a great time to get on 10 meter um, single sideband. As I mentioned earlier, worldwide contacts under good times, but during sunspot lows and limited activity distances, chances for technician costs greatly decrease. I mentioned earlier not to forget the e-skip possibilities, and I wrote an article that you can find on e-skip on six and 10 meters and 12 meters for that matter, using uh, FT8 and FT4. Okay, let's move on to another band or bands, uh, 220 UHF and microwaves. There's lots of open space with little activity. So if there's no one in your area that's operating on these, it might not be the best choice to get involved in. So you need to check first and see whether there's anyone else in your area that's using these particular bands before you make a great investment of time and money. But they're great for experimentation. And all you need is one other person that's willing to work with you. So if you can find at least one other operator that's willing to make contacts with you, it could be very fruitful endeavor learning more about these types of, of bands. During contest periods, there is some activity in almost every area, and there are some specialized modes such as fast scan television, Wi-Fi, and other things that you can use these bands with that you can't use on any other bands available to the amateur radio operators. And I have a link here to an article on getting started in amateur microwave radio. So that's, that's it for the, the bands, but let's talk now about some of the different uh, types of activities. Even though most technicians have been on VHF, quite often two meters, there is life beyond FM. You, both VHF and UHF single sideband activity is very predominant in weak signal work, contesting, and satellite operation. Although there are satellites that operate on FM, there are also satellites that operate on CW and single sideband. Uh, K0NR, who's speaking at our club next month, has a book out called uh, um, VHF Summits and More, and he has a good article here on getting started on two meter single sideband. And if you've never done that before, it's great. Even if you're, you don't have to be a technician to get involved in two meter single sideband or, two meter, or six meter single sideband activity are great fun. One of the biggest differences, most hams who have been doing FM traditionally have vertically polarized antennas at their home station. And these type of modes benefit from horizontal polarization. So if you want to get involved in two meter single sideband, it might be worth your investment to put together a very simple, and you can do it very inexpensive, uh, vertically polarized antenna at your location. So you're not disappointed by the results of using the same um, vertical, uh, vertically polarized antenna that you would use for your FM contacts. One of the things that a lot of people say is, I'm not sure if I want to get on HF. I don't have the time right now. I don't have the money and I don't have any place to put up an antenna. And I tell them the same thing I tell a lot of the students I work with, the youth that I work with. How about I give you a free uh, 160 meter through six meter receiver, then you don't even need to put up an antenna for, and it's available all day, all the time. And if the bands are dead in your area, you can pick another point in the world to operate your radio from. So I have a link here to a document I put together on uh, 
online tunable software defined radios. There's two main groups. Uh, there's the, the Kiwi radios and then some of the other systems that are out there. But these will allow you to pick a radio around the world and operate without having to have an antenna or a radio for that matter. Let's go quickly there to the link and I'll just give you a quick demonstration. So if we were to go out there and uh, go to one of these locations, I could tune in a radio and I have it in this document here information on how to use some of the radios, how the commands work. And then in addition, I have a list of the frequencies that a new listener might want to use if they want to listen to amateur radio operations in the HF band. And even the time of day that it's best to do it. Because I remember as a very new novice, I spent a lot of time during the day listening on 80 meters and a lot of time at night listening on 10 meters and never could figure out why there was never anyone there. So I put this information available to people. But when you go to these links, you'll find just many, many uh, available radios out there. Let's go to the um, web SDR. These are radios around the world. And you can pick any of these radios in this list and tune them by just going to them. And the same thing with the Kiwi radios. So I'll leave that for you to explore. The tiny.cc free RX is the link. And again, all the links in this presentation are available at tiny.cc slash B-T-E-C-H, B-Tech. CW, having fun with Morse. Uh, the original novice CW allocations on 80, 40, and 50 meters is available to the technicians. Unfortunately, not much activity on these upper portions of the CW band during typical days. But during contest activity, there's usually even more stations available there. But there are stations available there for you to talk to. You do not need to be a CW expert to make CW contacts. And I have a separate presentation uh, called Having Fun with Morris. And uh, I don't think I turned my sound on when I shared my screen, so you might not be hearing this, but there's Morris code going on in the background. Um, in that, this presentation talks about a lot of different ways that you can uh, become proficient in CW and some ways you can be, make contacts even before you become proficient by using uh, CW decoders, both radio-based and software-based. If you're interested in learning CW, probably one of the best ways to do it is to have someone else who's interested work with you. And typically in, in years past, this might be done in an in-person class or with a mentor uh, that works with you. But there's two great online sources available right now, the CW Academy and the Long Island's online CW classes. Both of these are great ideas if you're interested in becoming CW proficient, or if you're already proficient, you wanna increase your speed or your operating capability. These are both good organizations out there. Digital modes, FT8 and FT4, probably the fastest growing amateur radio modes. They've only been around for just a few years, but there's been tons of activity on these bands. I just, I'm three states shy of completing my worked all states 11 bands FT8. So I've got 547 done. I got three more to go to finish them up. So if anyone out there is in Alaska or Hawaii, I still need six meters on FT8. Uh, but these are available to text on 10 meters, 6 meters, and 2 meters. They are not available on the lower portion, on, the, on 80, 40, or 15, as we mentioned earlier with the CW bands. And the thing about these is they are modes that will just continue to keep growing in number. FT4 is less than a year and a couple months old, um, and it just came out. And there'll be new modes coming out all the time. These are the so-called sound card modes, and they're very easy to add by just changing software. So as I said earlier, it's one of the fastest growing areas of amateur radio, and I have a whole presentation on it at tiny.cc slash FT8 FT4. Now let's say you don't have the money to pick up a new radio and you're stuck with your handheld. Well, you can do some FM simplex work, whether you're using a handheld or a mobile radio or a base radio. Simplex FM opens up a whole new world of operating it's quite different from repeater operation. Uh, you don't necessarily have the strongest signals, um, but it allows you to experiment with antennas and different things and get your signal to sound better. So it's actually a very great way to get more involved in the antenna and uh, other aspects of radio that you do not get by using a repeater. Uh, 
you can experiment with antennas, amplifiers. Again, you can run as much power as you're allowed to as a technician, and you have just as much as an extra class on two meters and six meters. Many local clubs and organizations hold two meter FM simplex contests, and I know our local club did it on a regular basis. And often grid squares are used for the um, scoring of those contests. Our local one used the six digit grid square uh, as the multiplier. So just by moving very short distances, you could change your multiplier. And I have some videos available on FM simplex operation. Satellites in space. This is uh, Sean KX9X. And um, with the rare exception of a few older HF satellites, all satellite privileges are available to technicians. There are five main space or satellite types of operation. Uh, low Earth orbit FM based satellites are probably one of the easiest to get involved with, and they're one of the least expensive because quite often you can use your dual band HT with them. Low Earth orbit uh, linear transponder uh, satellites use single sideband CW, and they're a little bit more involved to learn how to use, especially because of the Doppler shift changes that occur. <coughs> Excuse me. But they're still very doable. And with your privileges as a technician class license, you have just as much right as any other operating class. Higher orbit tr uh, linear transponders are not that much available right now, but I had a great time with them when they were available and hopefully we'll get some uh, coming up later. There are currently no geosynchronous orbit uh, amateur satellites over the United States, but there is one over um, some of region one has some geosynchronous orbits, uh, I, um, the IARU region one. And then the last uh, space activity is the space station. A great point for new satellite operators is the low Earth orbit FM satellites. Easier to use, you can often use existing dual band uh, HT, and all you need is a very simple antenna such as this aero portable antenna here. This is an antenna that you can't see the elements for two meters because they're horizontal here, but you can see the UHF or 440 elements and this can easily be um, rotated in the air. Sean put together a great series uh, in conjunction with the um, DX Engineering blog on all bands. And by the way, if you've never read that, again, DX Engineering on all bands, it's a great blog and there's lots of good art, uh, edit writers on that blog, including Sean. And he put together a series of six uh, videos on using satellites. Sean also, I'm sorry, six documents, and then he also has corresponding YouTube videos to go with them. I have some additional links here for satellite operation. Uh, an article I put together on uh, using FM satellites, a uh, link to AMSAT, which is the organization of amateur radio operators that uh, use satellites considerably. And then a couple other links here. And again, these uh, pictures here are links also for the uh, tracking capability so you can track the satellites, something that you have to do. So moving on to another activity, contesting. VHF and UHF contest, and coming up very soon will be the AWRL winter uh, January VHF UHF contest, and it's a great time to get on. Unfortunately, there's usually minimal FM activity, so someone with a handheld VHT uh, might be able to make some contacts, but not sure if it depends on the area you're in, how much activity there is but there's quite often a lot of activity on single sideband and currently on FT8 and FT4. There are a number of 10 meter contests. Some contests are 10 meter only, but many other contests have 10 meters as one of the bands of operation. A lot of time ignored during the sunspot lows, but as we increase and the sunspots get better, there will be 10 meter activity in almost every multi-band contest. This year in the, the CQ worldwide, both single sideband and CW, I know I made a number of contacts on 10 meters. There are CW contests by using that 80, 40, and 15 meter privileges that are available. And you might think, well, if, if I'm just a beginner CW operator, contest would be a really hard place to make a CW contact. And that's really not true because you can sit there as long as you want and listen to the station, figure out what they want, and then just send your very quick exchange. And the exchange is so short, it's easy to do. So in my page on Fun with Morris, you'll find out how contest uh, contacts can be some of the easiest CW contacts, even though they t tend to go at faster speeds. 
There's an AWR presentation called Introduction to Amateur Radio Contesting that I did a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago now, November 3rd. And here's also the link to the slideshow that goes along with that. By the way, the AWR webinars are uh, something that I've done three of now and I'm going to be doing a fourth next week. And they're available on a variety of topics that are good for both beginners and for seasoned amateur radio operators. One of the activities is not a radio-based activity. It's something that enforces your radio activities, and that is something that's very important to new operators. That's finding an Elmer to help. An Elmer is someone who can help answer questions and avoid pitfalls of the hobby. They can answer your questions about what's the right rig to buy, loan you an antenna analyzer, or help you out when you're having trouble. Uh, by the way, the term Elmer first appeared in the March 71 issue of QST Magazine when Ron Newkirk called them the unsung fathers of amateur radio. And his Elmer, the reason why he called them Elmer was because it was Elmer P. Bud Forhard uh, Jr. W9GFF. So that's where the name Elmer comes from. But it's important that you have an Elmer. And where do you find an Elmer if you're just starting out? The first place you might want to look is the club that you just joined and they provided you your technician class license. Uh, lots of old timers are more than happy to help newcomers. Some are not, so you have to pick wisely. Many clubs have a formal Elmering programs, which is a great idea. If your club doesn't have one, you may want to consider that because when a new ham comes to your club, whether it's online or in person, they're quite often intimidated. But if someone approaches them and offers to help them and helps offers to Elmer them, they're more than receptive. So don't wait for them to ask. Ask them if you can help them. And if you're looking for a local club, the AWRL has a set of listings and QRZ.com has a set of listings. And when you find an Elmer, don't find this Elmer. Look for this Elmer instead. Elmer FUD won't help you out very much. Nowadays, you might find your Elmer online. There's lots of websites and mailing lists. And one common fallacy is that you can only have one Elmer. And I suggest you have multiple Elmers. In fact, I suggest you have both personal Elmers and online Elmers. By uh, participating in mailing list, you can get a lot of good information, and uh, you can get some of the Elm Ring online, too. So that's the presentation for tonight. And here's the link again, tiny.cc slash btech uh, that's available for you to uh, go into depth. And by coming to my presentation tonight, you are required to go, in, go into more detail because I've given you all these links. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, and I'm going to take questions, comments, and complaints. Well, thanks, Ashley. That's, that was a good presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I'm talking here. Um, when we get done here, could you send me that presentation so I can get it out to everybody afterwards? Yes. Okay. And uh, I, I keep my presentation as a as a, a Google slideshow, so it's always available. And the reason why I do that is because I'm always making corrections, additions, <laughs> and um, I'm I'm already signed up to do this presentation two more times, so I'll keep tweaking it. So none of my presentations ever end up being the same size; they only continue to grow over time. So I will make it available to anyone. All right, I'm looking at the chat, Barry. You want to look at chat and see what we got for questions? We're pretty good on chat. Just one uh, about using Arden on 900 megahertz on UHF. I don't think you mentioned that. And I, I did not. I mentioned microwave, but I didn't mention uh, the bands that it was available on. That is, that is the band, of course. Okay. And we basically answered all the other questions. On oh, very good. Holy and man. I see that we. I see that we have a lot of old timers out there as, as myself. So I hope the main thing that you get out of tonight is you pass this on to someone else who is just starting out. I am hopeful that this uh, video, along with several others, will make it into clubs where they can use it uh, to energize some of their, their club activities and get involved with the things that he's pointing out here now. I think he's done a good job. Lots and lots of good suggestions. I'm just going to bring up one th short thing here on the screen. I forgot to show because I didn't go past this. Let me just bring up this up for a second here. Okay, one second. Let's get this to share right. Uh, this is my email contact information again. And these are some of the other presentations that I have available. And here's a longer list. And I'm also available if your club is interested in an online presentation. 
Uh, I spend a, quite a bit of my time sitting here doing this, and I'm more than happy to do this live for your club. So in addition to passing on this recording, you're also welcome to uh, have me for this topic or any of the other topics I do, or if there's a topic that's not listed there, I'll be happy to put something together. Uh, matter of fact, Dan just mentioned this. We, this just came up about a week ago, this topic, and I put this together the next day for him. Yes, I appreciate that very much. And that, you know, folks, we get our topics from you guys. So, you know, tell us what you want. Tell us what, you, what interests you, what your clubs could be interested in, what we can do. And uh, that's, we get it from you guys. These, all these things just don't come out of thin air. You guys are a huge part of that. So let us know. A lot of clubs don't show or don't teach their technicians or the newly licensed technician of this. And there's bands that are underutilized, especially on UHF and above, that if we don't start to use them, we're going to start to lose them. And we need to get the technicians uh, and ourselves up there and experimenting and playing around. And uh, that will keep a lot of the younger people, especially the newer techs, interested because that's an area where they want to, might want to explore as a career. So, yes, it's something very important to do. Barry, we've already started losing them. Yep, that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Are there right. any more questions, questions out there? Questions out there. Barry brings up a great point, and one of the things that got mentioned was amateur digital television. And I realize that probably for most of us, that's kind of a niche market. But uh, a couple years back, before the world turned upside down and closed the doors, um, we were asked to participate in a steam fest at our local high school, which invited a lot of other local schools. And I'll be honest, the two things that had a line, we didn't give away anything, right? Other people were giving away stuff. And, uh, but the two booths that we did that had a line, the longest line was um, amateur digital television. We partnered with another club, and we set up a little two-way TV link where you had one kid sat in a chair on one side of the room, and had a TV camera and a, and a monitor, and another kid sat in a chair on the other side of the room with a TV camera and a monitor. Simple one watt, right? Sit down, talk to your friend across the room. Loved it. The other thing that was that they, one of the local clubs we partnered with had a uh, repurposed news van where they were able to connect to the local digital TV system. Um, you know, I think for the young people, that was really intriguing um, and really captured their attention. And the other thing, believe it or not, that captured the attention of a lot of young people was CW. Our two guys that were doing CW never slowed down. In fact, uh, our, one of our CW operators at the end, he like got up and he's like, man, I'm glad this is over because my wrist is just killing <laughs> You know, he'd demo and let the kid do it. He'd demo and let the kid do it, right? So so let's, I, I think from that experience, we learned that the, the new technology is intriguing and just flat out making contact with people. Like I just learned tonight, I thought text did, could not do digital on 10 meters. And finding that out is going to really kind of change a little bit from when text asked me, well, what can I do to get on HF? I'm going to. I'm going to roll right out there because um, I made 27 contacts so far this week on 10 meters on FD8 myself, just sitting here doing the work. So great presentation. You mentioned that you had a YouTube video and the slides together. Is that something that's synchronized if somebody wanted to kind of proctor one of your presentations in a club meeting or um, maybe you could touch on how that works? Um, no, the one I was talking about was a presentation that I did for uh, AWRL, and all my presentations that I do that are recorded, I always have a separate slideshow. They're not necessarily synchronized, but because of the because of the fact that all my presentations are full of links for resources, I always feel that I need to make sure that the people have the slideshow available to them, not just, not just the video. Video. So anytime so I post, post the video, I always put. Every time I post the video, I also video, post, I the, post the. Um, the um, Dan, am I getting Dan, bad I, feedback, or is that? No, that's John still talking. Okay, John, I'm sorry to talk I'm over you. Back. 
What? No, I think it's actually not somebody's mic. If you just mute everybody, we should be better. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute everybody, and uh, you're gonna have to unmute there, uh, Anthony. Okay. Okay. I might also ask, rather than just jumping in, folks, that's what we have the raise the hand thing and the chat thing for. List your questions, or uh, uh, raise your hand uh, at the below your participants there, so we don't have people doubling on top of each other and so forth. And it's just it makes these a lot better. Okay, Anthony, go on. Yes, sorry, John, I didn't mean to talk over there, but I, I just wanted to uh, say that because all my slideshows, all my videos that I'm doing slideshows in, the slideshows are full of links. So I always wanna make sure that I have the links available. So that's why I always provide the slideshow and the video if I do a video. Um, and along your lines of things that I, the kids find interesting, one of the things that I forgot to put in this talk and I'm gonna add it after today is fox hunting. Uh, that's another activity that techs can get involved in. It doesn't actually require you to have a license to do fox hunting, but of course it's available to technicians also. And uh, of course, technicians can be the people that are the, are the, are the foxes, not just the hunters because they can transmit. So um, I'm going to add fox hunting to this presentation. As I said, once I start one of these, they just grow and grow. But uh, again, thanks for the comments. And I, I do agree also on the CW. I, again, working with kids, that's one thing they really like. And, one of the areas that I do a lot of work in is uh, youth, and I have web pages full of resources for uh, youth and amateur radio. So um, at kzt.com, my website, or ztlearn.com, my school website, there's a kids' radio uh, web page for youth, and there's also a teacher's web page available. So I'll go ahead and see if there's any other questions. I don't see any raised hands, and I don't see anything in chat. How about you, Barry? You see anything? Nope. Nothing in chat. I don't see any raised hands either. Okay. We're good. Well, I'd be happy to answer questions, so please feel free. When I send out the follow-up, I would be. I'm going to be sure to include you, inclusive with what the, the presentation tonight. I'll put in the email itself, uh, Anthony's email address, so it'd be easy for you to follow up with some questions. I'm going to go ahead and share that page. If you, if you have a minute here, I'll just go ahead and show that I was talking about for the youth pages real quick. Uh, Dan, Matthew raised his hand. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. While I'm bringing this page up, go ahead and bring up your question. Yeah. I'm, I'm new to the ham stuff. I've only had it for seven years or so and that's all I played with was VHF and UHF so now that I I've been exploring a little bit more on the HF stuff so I'm trying to get my general but now I know I can play with a lot of the other frequencies and I think what will happen is as you play with these other things you're going to even want to get your general more because you're going to find out the, the fact that these are great things to do and the, to be able to do them. So I don't want to discourage you from getting your general, but um, that's great. So I'm going to show the screen here. This is my website, kzt.com. And there's a section here for students and teachers. The first link here is ham radio uh, youth resources. And there's a lot of information here. And one of them, um, especially this third one, this ham radio handout, this is something that I created for clubs to be able to hand out at field days on their information table or if you might be doing any type of outreach. And it's nice because you can print it out and put it and laminate it to the table and the kids are the, can scan the QR codes with their phone and bring all the handouts home without having to lose the paper. So this way it gets home for sure. This one right here will get you the whole sheet or you can do the individual ones. Um, the Kids Radio Zone is a page designed for kids, and it's on my learning site, so it takes you out to another site, ztlearn.com, and it has a variety of resources on there, including the Zach and Max comic books, which you can see, of course, but a lot of things, and one of the things I stress with my youth outreach is not just amateur radio, but radio technology in general, so that you'll find some things on broadcast radio and some other things here in addition to the amateur radio. But again, the whole idea of the SDRs are a really great idea for kids. But um, as far as Morse code, a number of Morse code things, including a, a little gimmick key that we build. And 
it's a under two dollar uh, Morse code key that uses a clothespin key and uh, a computer buzzer. And these have been great fun with the kids because they get to build it themselves and then operate it and uh, do send Morse code with it. Again, those are all available on this. All these resources are available at my kzt.com site under students and teachers resources. Let me stop sharing here. Other questions? Is there any other operating modes or techniques or bands that I that I forgot, like the fox hunting? It's one question in the chat, Anthony. If you want, if you want me to, from Dan in California. Oh, okay. Let me see. He wants to know how much. How much lead time you need for making a, one of your presentations to an all hands every Zoom meeting? Um, I usually need about five minutes to get ready. You got to tell me five minutes before you want me to start talking. No, I'm just kidding. Um, as far as lead time, it's basically whether I'm already scheduled to do something or not. Uh, I am, uh, I'm retired, so I'm available quite often. But right now, like for example, this, this week I'm doing six presentations for six different groups, including the one tonight. Um, but a lot of times I'm not, so just, I'm more than happy. Just give me an, drop me an email and, uh, if the time's available. The other thing I really suggest too, uh, with a lot of times when I'm presenting to smaller clubs, invite some of your other neighboring clubs to join us because it's zoom based. Um, it's nice to combine. So when I was doing a lot of the field day presentations last summer, uh, last spring, actually, uh, I had a couple clubs contact me and I had three clubs that contacted me and one and one on the same day. I said, I'll be happy to do it, but you all got to come together. We'll do it one as one group. So we combined all three of them. So we had a three state um, Zoom meeting and it was just as easy as having everyone in the same room. There's a lot of good stuff that's coming out of this pandemic, and uh, that, that is one of it. There's a lot of bad stuff, too. I don't want to minimize it, but we're learning new things. It's going to be with us for a long time, and it's going to, uh, amateur radio itself are going to look a little different going down the line just because of the new things we're learning now. Heather's, Heather's question. Um, on the web SDRs, uh, most of them that are listed on those lists do not require you to be uh, – they give you permission to use them. They're, they're all open ones. There are some closed ones, but you won't find those on my list. Those lists are all open ones. So you don't need permission to use them. And because they're receive only, there's no problem with licensing. Um, a question from Dan. Dan had his hand up there. Oh, thanks. Did I update myself out of having the uh, raise hand thing and in, in, uh, participants? I, just I don't think it's on tonight on the Zoom session we're in. I'm not sure why that is. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, congrats, kudos for being so good at doing these presentations. Um, I, if we wanted you on like a 5.30 p.m. Sunday Zoom meeting, three weeks or two weeks or one week, lead time would be useful. Oh, that, no problem. I, I even did some meetings with some group in England. I had to do it 5.30 in the morning, so it's not, not a problem. Okay, we're we're uh, we're not that enthusiastic. <laughs> well, that was their evening meeting. It was five thirty. <laughs> yeah, I get it. All right, thanks a whole lot. You did a great job. It's oh. and, and this is a wonderful topic because uh, without new hams getting interested in multi modes, Aries dies on the vine. We uh, so we hope we hope to have some more presentations like this uh, to energize that kind of stuff. And trust me, you'll be seeing Anthony back again and again. He's got a lot of good material and is very experienced at it. Okay. Uh, so Dan, Dan. Has got me, Dan has got me lined up for the 17th. I'm going to be doing one on using Zoom and Google Meet and other types of online uh, tools for your, uh, for your local club meetings. So I'm going to be doing that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dan. Go ahead. No, no you no, did I just fine. <laughs> I was going to ask Big D Dan if he updated us out of having the uh, hand raise feature in the participants list. No, I I didn't turn that off. It should. No, everybody, everything. Everybody else have it except for Anthony and me. Well, Anthony wouldn't have it, but um, others would. Yeah, I won't have it right now because I'm a host. Yeah. Right. Um, Oscar, raise your hand. 
did that, my hand is raised. Not that one. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the only one that is working. Oh, well, I'll have, ah, we'll okay. have to check it out afterwards, see what's going on. All right, no worries. I just thought it was different. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I saw a question here about uh, uh, hot spots. And uh, I didn't really mention that too much because it's tied into the repeater thing, but that is another great activity. Um, and I, I think it's a, it's, it's a good activity because it incorporates uh, multiple technologies. So New Ham getting in, that might be a very interesting thing for them to get involved in. Um, 10 meter data is okay for tech, not just limited to CW, and that is correct. Uh, 10 meter data is available uh, for techs. Yeah, Pi Star um, is an interesting bite to chew on, and it's it's remarkably informative about what can be done with the internet. But are we sure we want to make new amateurs internet dependent? I think there's room for everything here. Uh, V Star, V Star, DMR, and all that is radio. At some point, you do have I have some uh, internet uh, IP radios themselves. But by and large, there's repeaters out there. And when you're talking, I don't care if you're on the internet or where you are, you're going to be talking to truck drivers and people that are sitting in their homes and on radios all over the place. So it really ties in. Well, I mean, I, 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 you don't want to know how much time I spent learning to use D-Star. I forget D-Star. That's <laughs> responsible for me being here today because it got me re-radioactive. But Pi-Star and DMR, I think, is going to be uh, a sort of become a de facto God channel for uh, coordinating things um, be just because it has so much flexibility in terms of, you know, maintaining a channel where you can talk fairly well as long as you either have access to the internet or a, uh, DM, a Brandmeister DMR repeater. One of the things I talk to on class, I, I want to go to clubs and we bring up the digital communicate, digital voice communications and they say, well, what happens? You lose the internet. Well, what happens? You lose the internet. You just got a repeater up there. It's just like you do now. It's just it's not tied to the world. And if you, and if you, when your internet comes back, you get tied back to the world, but you're never without that communications. Now, if you're just, if you're settled down to internet access only, you're going to have, that will be a problem. But for those that uh, are using their radios or handhelds, fix whatever, to access the repeaters and, and the stuff around, there's, you know, it is very much amateur radio. Yeah, in terms of simplex, finding a clear simplex channel on DMR is really easy. It's, uh, you've got the, uh, what is it, 15 times 2 times 11 different frequencies, number of simplex channels you can use in a local event to have couple of private lines going at the same time. Yes, it is. We don't want to make this into a digital voice. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry uh, about that. That's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. That's Anthony. a personal problem. Uh, well, thank you to um, KD6UCE. I've already added APERS to my uh, slide. That's why I like this uh, whole idea of these flexible slides, because I've already added it to the list here for activities. Uh, and I didn't mention that. So I will add that. And I will also add fox hunting to the list of activities here. Um, Skywarn too. Well, I, I didn't really want to talk about uh, Skywarn is is more to me is more of a, a um, an organizational type thing. There's a lot of things like that. I, I just didn't do it specifically as an activity, not necessarily because it wasn't it wasn't an activity. It is an activity, but I was trying to distinguish more between activities that re involve you doing a new technology and Skywarn in most cases is quite a long, quite similar to the lines that most people are doing with their FM only or repeater only operations. This, this year, Skywarn Recognition Day was the most mode agnostic Skywarn Recognition Day in the history of Skywarn. Well, that's great. Yeah, Noah did, a, they, were, they were real impressive, the guys who organized that. And well, I, Mike Corey was on that team, I think. Yeah, but I mean, I didn't include it for the same reason I didn't include Aries on this or uh, other other type of organized activities of that sense. Okay. So I didn't uh, mean ben, to slight you all. I, I just muted Dan and I'm going to mute everybody else. We got to stop just jumping in and doubling on people here. Go ahead, Anthony. Um, I was just saying, I didn't want to, I, I, I didn't want to exclude some things, but I didn't really include uh, Skywarn 
you know, I think I'm muted here. No, you're not. You're okay, I'm sorry. I got my got my chat over overcame my uh, participant screen. Okay, there we go. I'm back. Okay, so yeah, I didn't include that or Aries or other types of things, but uh, they are good activities to be involved in. So I'm going to pick on someone I see in the audience there because Skyler has a fairly new call there. So Skyler, if you don't mind, have you done any of these activities? Oh, I scared Skyler away. Skyler, sorry, didn't mean to scare you away. He's there. He's pointing okay. out. He's muted. I'm muted. Okay. Unmute. There we go. Try to unmute yourself with the space bar. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Skylar. <laughs> well, we got video. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Do you find? So, what was the question? Have, have you done any any type of activities that you found really interesting on the amateur radio? Uh. I only do VHF and UHF pretty much right now. Okay. Have you done it? Have you done any simplex activities? But I'm getting into DMR here. I just got a new radio DMR. Well, that's great. Uh, I've done a one four six five two zero, but no luck with it. Well, keep it up. I, I as I said during the contest activity periods or periods of activity for different. Uh, Different things like contesting, you'll hear more activity than during the normal times. Well, thank you. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to impose upon you, but I wanted to get your opinion there. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any any more questions or? Uh, any, yeah. Any more questions? Uh, no problem. I was just busy. <laughs> Are there any uh, comments? I have a comment. This is Whiskey Six Lima India Kilo from Seal Beach, California. Um, when I was listening to the Nashville bombing, the one comment that this op operator mentioned was having an AM FM radio because there was no communication. And the only way he knew things, what was going on outside of the situation, was having that very inexpensive AM FM radio. Just a comment to share. You know, and I'm going to me mention one thing also. I didn't. I, those SDRs I talked about earlier, they will work with your phone just fine too. And they do cover commercial AM and FM. So it's a great way to even listen to FM and AM stations either where you're at or at a different location. So if you want to quickly get tuned into a, you know, to news in a different area or weather in a different area, um, those, those SDRs work great for that. Yes, uh, Dan. 